All right, we are looking at Laban's life again this morning and some things that we don't want to do that Laban did. Uh, Laban, the big, the big thing that we want to learn from Laban that I've stressed is that he, and you heard me say it every week, that Laban uh, had his, his son-in-law, his two daughters, and he had these grandchildren being born all around him, and they were strangers to him. That's what his own daughter said. We're strangers to our father. And Laban left. He lost the opportunity to love them and be a blessing to them. And, and it gets worse. It gets worse because at the end of the story here, uh, they're separated, and Laban goes his way. And it's just a sad, it's a sad story. And uh, last week we uh, stopped on the point without going reviewing, because it'd be a lot to review. We stopped on the point, and for those that are taking notes on, you know, don'ts, uh, things not to do that Laban did, uh, we stopped on, it'd be number 10, uh, don't follow false gods or false idols. And we said that, you know, the New Testament makes it clear that, yes, God's people today, we might not fall graven images, but the world has their images uh, of covetousness and, and things that go along. We said uh, there's rock music idols, there's sports idols, there's Hollywood idols, there's sex idols, and the New Testament makes it clear the the book of first john that talks about loving god and loving one another it ends with that little verse you know that little verse that first john ends with little children keep yourselves from idols keep yourself from from idols and here you know we see in this passage that uh fallen false gods fallen idols i could say that when i was a teenager uh, basketball was an idol to me. I love basketball. And you can enjoy a sport and learn. You can learn from playing the sport, but you can also be sidetracked and uh, taken in so that it's like everything, uh, everything to you. And it's just, how could, how could basketball mean so much to, uh, little short stout guy uh, shh, it just sucks you in and uh, what we can see two things that happen when you when you are taken by false idols two things well let's read down through we'll back up and uh, mention these two things and then we'll continue on a few more don'ts and don't things you, you don't want to do that Laban did. And then I wanted to conclude it with some lessons we see from just looking back over the story and lessons that we learned from Jacob. But let's start reading in verse 32. And we'll read down through the rest of the chapter and back up in... Look at this. It says, um, Jacob says, uh, With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Before our brethren discern thou what is thy, thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban, we said that Rachel may have stolen them. We don't know exactly what was running through her mind. But she may have stolen them because... These images, which the, uh, the Hebrews refers to them as teraphim, from what I read, the teraphim, which was something that would establish the head of the household's authority, and they were thought to give him prosperity. And Rachel, was, it seems, was pretty sick and tired of that. She just said, our father's not going to give us any kind of inheritance. We might as well leave here. And so she takes those images 
and, and sits on them as to say, you know, this is what I think of your God's dad, and she sits on them. Now, she may have still had some kind of attraction to those gods because we looked last week at how later on Jacob has to tell his family, put away the, put away the gods that are among you. Just get rid of them. And it's still true for us today, especially in America, uh, where so many things can become a god, uh, to just constantly, okay, I'm putting the Lord first. The Lord's coming first in my life. And I'm not going to be sidetracked by any of the pleasures or, or worldly uh, things that the world offers me. So, but anyway, Rachel stole her father's gods. And verse 33, And Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maidservants' tents, but he found them not. Then went he out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture and sat upon them, like a storage compartment there. And it's like a, a camel's glove compartment. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. She said to her father, Let it not displease my lord, that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the images. And Jacob was wroth. Finally, Jacob can't take it anymore. And he's been long-suffering and turning the other cheek, and I believe he left uh, you know, it was wise the way he left, so he's trying to avoid a confrontation and just get out of there and knew that his father-in-law was not going to be happy. And, but now Jacob is finally going to speak his mind. Jacob was wroth and chode with Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, you know, all these things that Jacob said are so true, but the Bible does say, put away all anger, and that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. He could, he could have pressed this, the pre, preface, pre, pre, prefaced this. We're just saying, you know, Dad, we, uh, Dad Laban, you know, we really care about you, but you've cheated us so much. Um, doesn't, it doesn't pay to yell. You know, people get families, families that yell at each other and, and show disrespect. And it's, it's not the right way. We know it's not the biblical way. It is to be patient and loving and kind, but I tell you what, if anybody, not to say that Jacob didn't have a good reason to be angry. Good reason to be angry. Jacob answered and said to Laban, what is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren, that they may judge between us both. This twenty years have, have I been with thee, thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast a young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. That which was torn of beasts I brought not unto thee, I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was in the day... The drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. That was last night uh, for a lot of you out plowing snow and, and belts breaking and all the no sleep last night. Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I served thee 14 years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wage 10 times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hadst sent me 
away now empty. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. And Jacob just turns it all to, you know, God is taking care of me. God is watching over me. God sees all the affliction I've gone through. And that's the way we've got to be, is just keep trusting in the Lord, walking with the Lord, because there's a lot of difficult things and difficult things in life. But the Lord knows. Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters. And these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. Lion. It's just like, well, we're going to, like I said, we'll back up and look at this. Uh, and what can I do this day unto these my daughters, or unto thy children, which they have borne? I mean, there's partial truth there. Uh, now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, let it be for a witness between me and thee. Now Laban's getting spiritual. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. Jacob said unto his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. They did eat there upon the heap. That was a practice of, joke, uh, of Jacob. He wanted to remember the times that God worked in his life the things God did in his life, and he would take and set up a pillar uh, as remembrance before the Lord. And Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha, but Jacob called it Gilead. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore was the name of it Gilead. And Mizpah, for he said, The Lord watched between me and thee, when we are absent from one another. If thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness between me and thee. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar, which I have cast between me and thee. This heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and that thou shalt not pass over this heap, and this pillar unto me for harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judged between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount, called his brethren to eat bread. And they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. And early in the morning Laban rose up, kissed his sons and his daughters, and blessed them. Doesn't say he kissed Laban, which back when he met Laban, it just uh, he ran and kissed Laban, and I uh, uh, think he was still upset with Jacob. Did I say Jacob? Did I say I said Laban? Well, Laban, like you didn't kiss him tell there. Then Laban didn't. It's not mentioned that he kissed Jacob, which was common in those days, and Laban departed and returned unto his place. So, backing up, we said don't follow false images, that don't follow false idols. And there's two things here in this story that you see that a fallen false idols will make you do. And first of all, following a false idol will make you forget what should be your true priority? You know, you get wrapped up in something, uh, whether it's money, you make money an idol, or, uh, you know, a teenager gets wrapped up in some rock idol, and they start following rock music, the next thing they're doing is telling their parents they don't want to listen to them, leave them alone. Uh, they lose the priority of honoring their parents before the Lord, loving their parents, uh, loving the Lord. False idols will make you lose your proper priorities. Laban came to catch up with his family. Here he gets there, and instead of being concerned with his family, he's concerned about his idols. 
you know, idols, uh, idols are strange people. Uh, they exchange people. They turn people away from God, and they turn people away from true priorities and loving one another. Look at Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel says, verse 2, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Somebody starts following their, their idol, whatever, whether it's sports or money or uh, Hollywood, rock, whatever it may be, uh, it's a stumbling block. It's a stumbling block. And they've put the stumbling block of the iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of all, uh, of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. The Laban was estranged from God. He wasn't following God. False idols will... They'll make you lose your priorities, your true priorities. Another thing that we see in the story that false, false, fallen false idols will do is fallen false idols will make you to search for what you cannot find. They'll make you search for what you can't find. You know, some kid gets wrapped up in rock music and, oh, this is my... You know, this is my star, this is my, oh, I, oh, he's, oh, whatever. You know how kids get about that kind of stuff. Or some young man gets wrapped up in some sports figure. When I was a kid, it was uh, Michael Jordan, or even before that, uh, Dr. J, or whoever it is. And all you think about is, wow, what a great athlete, what a you know, you get wrapped up in that, and then you can't find, you start getting disillusioned, and false idols keep you from finding what you're looking for. And you hear stories of people that are constantly looking and can't find uh, they can't find what they're looking for. That happened to Solomon. Solomon. It was women. It was women. And it got him so that he couldn't find what he was looking for. Look at Ecclesiastes. He was searching everywhere. Except for he wasn't Seeking God, first of all. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 13. Solomon says, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under the heaven. Well, he's seeing wisdom apart from God. He's talking about his own brains. He's just seeking. And he said, this is... This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. That is, uh, God has created things the way he created man. If man is not seeking God first, he's just constantly seeking, constantly looking, and can't find uh, happiness, can't find satisfaction. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 25. And Solomon says again, he says, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom. This is like uh, college professors all across the United States that they're, 
They're seeking philosophy. They're seeking intelligence. Uh, they're seeking reason that uh, their reason is going to make sense of life and give them happiness. And they're seeking, they're never going to find it. And here's Saul, uh, uh, Laban, Laban is looking for his idols, and he can't find them. He can't find them. Well, they've never done him any good anyway. And Solomon just says, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom, the reason of things, and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets in her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape her, uh, shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. And just couldn't find what he was looking for. Couldn't find fulfillment. That's what fallen false idols do. Back to our story, Genesis chapter 31. Next thing that you don't want to do, you don't want to do, uh, that Laban did is, number 11, don't provoke your children to anger. Don't provoke your children to anger. And that's just why finally Jacob couldn't take it anymore. And we know he's a son-in-law, but Laban had pressed him. And Laban had, we know, cheated him and mistreated him. And now he's putting Jacob on the spot. And the Bible, the Bible clearly says, don't provoke your children to wrath. Twice it says it. Turn to Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. Verse 21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Well, that verse comes after. Uh, verse 19 says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You want to see a, a young person that's discouraged, that is really discouraged? I remember years ago, this is way back. This is close to 30 years ago, this is probably 20, uh, 27, 28 years ago, we lived down uh, Auburn Lewiston area, and there was the captain of the football team came up missing. He came up missing. Scott Croto. Remember here, I was just, I didn't know, I did not know the kid, but I was just reading the newspaper articles, and it said, it interviewed his mother, and they interviewed his father and his father's girlfriend. And I'm just reading the story, and the story said he was one of the most popular kids at school, and he was a great athlete, and the school is, uh, the team was heading toward, they might win the championship this year, and, and you know, we expect foul play because there's no way he would be you know, depressed or, and I read, I read the story and said, well, that kid's family just broke all apart. His family's all broken apart. I bet that kid is depressed, and I bet he did something to himself. And later on, uh, they found that he, that young man had gone out in the woods and taken his life. You want to discourage, you want to discourage your children? Dads, you know, probably the number one way that dads discourage their children, provoke their children, and turn their children away from wanting anything to do with God is how they treat their wife, whether they love their wife. I, when I was in college in Pensacola, one of my roommates, one of my roommates said, my dad's a deacon at our church, and he thinks he's also... Uh, holy and, and mighty and big stuff at the church there. He said, uh, he said, this is what he said. He said, I could kill my dad. 
He acts, so, he acts so spiritual at church. And one of these days when he is yelling at my mother and treating my mother so terrible, he said, I'm just going to pound him. And then these, you know, like Laban, Laban, Puts on, he continues through the story, just putting on just his spiritual. He's so spiritual, and he's going he's gonna to tell his children, he's going to set his children straight, and he's going to set Jacob straight, and he's the big spiritual leader, and let's get this situation under control. Ah, uh, Laban, it's your fault. Don't provoke your children. Don't provoke your children. To anger. Skip down the passage after Jacob gives his reply, and of course Laban doesn't even act like he heard a thing. He didn't even hear a thing that Jacob said. There's no answer to uh, the, the things that Jacob complained here to his father-in-law about. Laban just ignores it all. You ever have somebody do that? You got some complaints, and you try to say, well, this is what, and they just ignore it like, I've done no wrong. I've done no wrong. Uh, number 12, what we don't want to do is don't forget to say you're sorry. At verse 43, verse 43, it says, and Laban answered, and what Laban, Laban should have answered and said is, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I've mistreated you over these years, and I am just so sorry. Will you please forgive me? But no, Laban just keeps defending himself and said, you know, these are my children, my daughters, my cattle. It's all about me, me, my, my, and he's so self-consumed. And he should have been asking for forgiveness. And other things we go down. So then Laban, you know, Laban takes control of the situation. He, could have, he should have taken control of the situation 20 years ago and said, I'm going to love my family and treat them the best I can. But now he's taking care, he's going to take control of the situation just in one, you know, one big moment. Well, that's not going to happen. Not one big moment, not, uh, maybe it could have, it could have if Laban had humbled himself. If you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, don't expect to heal family difficulties or problems with friends uh, if you don't humble yourself. And Laban, Laban wasn't humbling himself, but he was playing spiritual here. Laban says, you know, let's make this deal. Let's make this covenant. And interesting that as Laban makes his covenant, he also shows that he's still, he's still got big problems. And the last point I want to point out here, uh, you don't want to do what Laban did. Uh, don't evil surmise. Don't evil surmise. If you want to you want to you want to evil surmise about someone, do it about yourself. When the kids were young, and they'd be having some kind of squabble, and they'd go to my wife, and they'd say, well, you know, one of the kids would go to my wife and say, uh, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so did this, and they did that, and my, my wife would always say, tell me something bad about yourself. Tell me something bad about yourself. You know, some people, they can always see the bad in everybody else. Laban could see all the bad things in Jacob. And he could just, you know, he didn't, he didn't, and he didn't trust Jacob. And he's going to 
take this situation into his hands and, and he's going to be the big problem solver. You ever meet somebody that's they're going to be the big problem solver when they're the problem? Laban was the problem, but he's going to be the big problem solver. Give me a, just give me a break. And so Laban comes up with this idea, we're going to make a covenant and we've got to have peace between one another. And at least Laban had the right thought. But he had the wrong attitude. In verse 50, he says to Jacob here, If thou shalt afflict my daughters, well, who's been doing the affliction? And God had seen, God had seen who had been doing the affliction. But Laban, he can't see it. If you don't humble yourself, before God, then you can't see your own sin. You can't solve your problems. You can't deal with your problems in the right way if you don't humble yourself before God. But here, Laban is evil surmising about Jacob. He says, if thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness between me and thee. So, pretty much what Laban is saying here is, Jacob, I don't trust you, so we're going to come into this covenant here and uh, so that you'll behave yourself. Well, ungodly people, evil surmise. You ever hear, uh, you ever hear some, oh, you might never heard this because uh, uh, I've heard this a couple different times because uh, being a pastor, your ears kind of perk up. I remember uh, we were uh, eating at a Chinese buffet, was sitting there, and there were a table of old ladies sitting behind me. And I heard they start talking about uh, pastors and preachers. My ears go, what are they talking about over there? And it's like, uh, one of them says, I've never, uh, I've never met a uh, how old she said it, but to the extent, I've never met an honest preacher. I've never met an honest preacher. Um, and that will go for, you know, people say, I've never met an honest politician. Well, you say, yeah, all right. <laughs> right. Or I've never met an honest uh, used car salesman. Well, because if you sell new cars, then you're okay. Uh, I'd trust the used car deal before I'd trust the uh, whatever. But you know that somebody will sit back and say, Ah, oh, you can't trust a preacher. And they're, you know, they're felons and they've been in and out of prison and they're... Um, you got this great big list of problems, and they'll be saying, oh, you can't trust a preacher. They say that because they can't be trusted. And when you look at what the Bible mentions as evil surmise, and turn to 1 Timothy. Man, it's not that time already. 1 Timothy. Chapter 6, verse 3 says, If any man teach otherwise, consent not to hold some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So if somebody's ungodly, then the Bible says that he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, Evil surmisings. Just thinking the worst about people. That's the way Laban was. Uh, don't evil surmise. Don't think the worst of people. Esteem others better than your own self is what we're told in Philippians. So lots of lessons about Laban. But I just want to... Run over some lessons about Jacob that we've seen in this story is that um, 
First of all, from my story, number one, keep following God in spite of all the difficulties of life. Jacob had a rough 20 years. 20 years! Hard labor. Dealing with his family difficulties. Well, God was making Jacob. God was working on Jacob. God does the same thing with us. And just keep going. Keep loving the Lord. And also, the story tells us, it, it shows us that the subtlety of a wicked man can never prevent the power and wisdom and goodness of God. Even though Laban was treating Jacob rotten, God was taking care of Jacob. God will take care of you. Whatever situation you get put into, uh, God will be watching over you. Another lesson from this story is, number two, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Romans 12, 18. Jacob put up with so much. And the Bible tells us, you know, as much as, much as lieth in you. You say, well, I don't have enough. I don't have much lying in me. Well, just give it your all to live peaceably with all men. Number three here is agree quickly with your adversary while thou art in the way. That's Matthew 5, 25, the Lord said, agree quickly with your adversary while thou art in the way. What's that all about? Well, Jacob could have said, when Laban said, okay, let's make this covenant of peace between us, this agreement, Jacob could have said, get lost. Get lost. Don't talk to me about making a covenant of peace. 20 years you mistreated me, and now all of a sudden you want to make this peace treaty? No way. What good is that doing? You might as well try to live peaceably with all men and agree quickly with the adversary while it can be done. Okay. Jacob says, okay. We'll do this. Who's the winner in this situation? Well, God blesses Jacob. God blesses Jacob through this. Laban, uh, this is the last we hear of Laban. Uh, he returns to his place, and God, God blesses Jacob. But agree quickly with your adversary while thou art in the way. Fourthly, fourthly, big lesson here is remember God is the source of right relationships. It's interesting this whole story, this whole conflict ends with they said Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. I think it's interesting how Laban says in verse 51, behold this heap and behold this pillar which I have cast between me and thee. No, Jacob just did all that work. He said it out there. I also think it's interesting how Jacob offers sacrifice uh, and calls his brethren to eat bread, but doesn't mention Laban offered any sacrifice. And Jacob is clearly the godly man in the situation, but it, it shows us that that God is the source of right relationships. Too bad Laban hadn't realized that long ago. So in the story here, uh, verse, um, they, set, they set up this pile of stones, a heap of stones, and Laban calls it that long word there, Jajarsahadatha, which means a wit, uh, Heap of witnesses, or witness heap. And Jacob calls it in the Hebrew, just showing that everything he, he was saying he was doing, uh, he's leaning to the God of the Hebrews. But they set up these, these stones to be a reminder. And the reminder is, is God is witness. God is witness. God sees 
your family. God sees my family. God knows what goes on uh, with your children, my children. God knows what goes on, and God is witness. And if we're going to have right relationships, if Jacob and Laban were going to have any kind of peace between the two of them, it had to be through God. The second thing here is they said, uh, they call it Mizpah. Mizpah, which means watchtower. Watchtower. So God is witness and God is watching. And God is a source of our relationships. God's got to be put first if our relationships are going to be what they should be. The last thing here from my story is number five. God goes with a man who follows his ways. He doesn't go with the man who follows his own ways. So at the end of the story here, Laban goes back to his place. Well, Laban goes back to his place without the manager of his business. He goes back to his place without his daughters. He goes back to his place without his grandchildren. He goes back to his place I, I, we, without his, well, without his gods. He goes back to his place just empty. Jacob continues on his way, and what happens? What happens? Look at chapter 32. Starts out, verse 1. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Like, wow. Wow. The angels of God met him. Jacob honored the Lord through it all. Jacob put his fear. This is uh, really interesting that in our story, Laban says, you know, he trusts the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor. Well, the God of Nahor, we're told in Joshua 24, they follow false gods, the God of Nahor. And so Jacob is very specific when he says, He's, Jacob swears by the fear of his father Isaac, the true God. And when it's all said and done, Jacob goes in his way and the angels of God meet him. And Laban's never heard of again. And shh, sad story for Laban. Sad story for Laban. Happy story for Jacob. Happy story for us when we make God, God the center of our relationships, God the center of our lives, and give God the priority. Stop right there.